Hey, good morning, Mortgage Coach. Dave Savage here, and today I have Mr. Steve Scanlon. What's up, Steve? Hey, Dave. How are you? Hey, I'm doing good, buddy. So uh, congratulations on Still the Lizard, digging your new book. Uh, by the way, everybody, you can get it on Amazon, so check it out. Great book. Highly recommend it. Uh, so, Steve, today let's talk about how people can um, make change. You and I have been having just a a personal dialogue, you know, we haven't, we didn't do it over coffee like we usually do. Uh, we need to make sure we, we do meet up in a coffee shop soon. But let's, let's talk a little bit about what people can do to, to change their habits and their skills. I have been, you know, most of my keynotes recently have been talking about how mortgage companies and lenders need to upgrade their tech. Loan officers need to use their CRM more. Loan officers need to use mortgage code more. Uh, but changing isn't so easy. And I think most people think it's one of those things that it just happens or doesn't happen. It, could you walk us through some ideas and strategies, you know, from Rewire that would help uh, create a more predictable change for mortgage professionals and leaders? Yeah, I, I, it, Dave, I think I absolutely can do that. I, I, uh, I believe the dialogue that also was a part of what we were talking about was accountability and how people um, and companies um, really, as it pertains to change and actual execution and getting things done, I hear a lot about we need to up the accountability. I, I've worked with people who uh, want to create a program called the, the Culture of Accountability. And I just, that, you know, maybe it's because of the role that I'm in as the CEO of this company, but I hear the word accountability a lot. And so, uh, our little dialogue started because you and I were talking about that. And we were talking about a little challenge that you and I were doing. Um, uh, and, and the concept of accountability came up. And so I just want to preface it with saying I, I, uh, I've been writing some lately about this. Um, we're going to publish an article on it soon. And the title of the article, Dave, um, is really uh, to just to get people's attention because that's what titles do if we're being honest. Um, but it was, it's going to have something to do with the fact that accountability is not what we think it is. I, I don't think accountability, uh, I even say something probably a little crass or, you know, probably a little stronger than I should where I say accountability doesn't work. And when I told you that, you were like, whoa, 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 whoa. And you and I kind of got into a little bit of a debate uh, about this. And I think it prompted this call, in fact. And so just very quickly, I, I, I do want to... Um, tell people that I, it's not that I don't think accountability works. Um, I think um, what we've learned and what the research suggests is that accountability doesn't work if we're trying to utilize it before we change how we think. People are, people want to go out and go, man, if I just get my friend or my partner or my wife or, you know, my boss, somebody to hold me accountable, I'll get this done. Well, Often I have found that that line of thinking is a prosthetic for a change in how you think about a particular challenge or an opportunity or problem or something. If, if, people, if more people would sit back and go, you know, I need to use my tech better. I need to use mortgage coach better or I, more effectively or at all for that matter. Um, I need to use my CRM. I need to do this stuff. That's it. I'm going to call somebody. As opposed to thinking, how am I thinking about that? How is my thought process thinking? But as you and I have talked about many times, Dave, people, we're not trained to think about how we think. And in fact, the lizard brain, that's what the book that we wrote, the lizard brain always thinks it's right. So everything we think, we think we're right. And so it's rare that we would even come close to challenging our own thinking. And my point is, is if you don't challenge your own thinking and you go get accountability, it might work for a small period of time, but um, it typically wanes because we didn't change how we thought about it. This is precisely why people go on and off diets. This is precisely why um, people start things and don't complete things because I think they're kind of digging in the wrong hole, especially with regard to accountability. Now, to your point, I think accountability can be a good thing when you're in the process of also changing your thinking. So, I want to talk about what are some of the things that we can do to change our thinking um, about how we execute things. Because that's, I think, what people want to know. How no. do I? 
you know, how do I do these things? And so anyway, I, I just thought I'd preface that really quickly because of our dialogue around accountability. No, no, no doubt, Steve. So I want to just get everybody centered on this. So the conversation is, you know, well, Steve and I did have a bait. He's like, accountability doesn't work. And I'm like, well, when I think of all the times I've changed, sometimes it was part of the formula of the change that I had. And you're right. Sometimes it wasn't. But I do think I have a line, Steve, that every time I've made a change, there was a change of thinking. And sometimes I needed added accountability and sometimes I didn't. And then also, as I, you know, I, I have been evangelizing mortgage coach now for 20 years. And, you know, there's just been people, you know, like Josh Metals, you know, top producer. I'd see him at all the events. For years, I would like, Josh, you know, you should use mortgage coach. You're losing money. You know, it got to be the point where I know, Dave, I know, I know. And then all of a sudden he changed. And I'm like, what happened? And to your point, it changed the way he thinks. Uh, I just interviewed um, Kelly Marsh with Cornerstone, someone that had been thinking about adopting Mortgage Coach, you know, $100 million producer, killing it, not in a lot of pain, doing a lot of production, but she changed the way she thinks, and boom, you know, it happened. So uh, let's, let's roll out some ideas so that mortgage professionals, and by the way, if you're watching this and you're a manager, Think of this as an opportunity. You know, most managers want their loan officers to use the tech stack, tech stack, and the tools they have better. So that's one thing that we can do to empower change. Most managers want their sales force to prospect more. Uh, so let's kind of put it in those two funnels. What are some tactics that a mortgage professional that wants to implement some personal change, you know, what, what are some things they can do? What's an obstacle course that we could run them through that would you know help them change with more prediction and more effectiveness um yeah with i think with the confines of the time that we have i mean i maybe we come on and do your hour-long thing at some other point and and um really flesh these out further and further when you talk about tactics and strategies um i just want to preface the i'm going to give i'm going to give people three ways that i think they can actually execute in their life and in their business but the tactics in these ways, I like, you know, I always are tell you, people. Are you, are you giving me a hard time? You give me a hard time. Yeah. I always tell people, savage is such a, dude, give me the, the tangible stuff, man. Give me the, give me the meat. Give me scripts. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, if these three things, if you, if, if, if how I prefaced this and said, we need to think about the way that we think. The work of rewire is less about, all right, go make five calls, do this like this, like this, like this. That's a very tactical, tangible strategy. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with saying you need to make this many calls. It needs to be smart goals, right? Specific, measurable, attainable, relevant with the time frame and all of this stuff. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. But when it comes to thinking, they're usually a little bit more uh, comprehensive, I would say. And so even though I can lay them out in a few minutes here, um, they probably require a little bit more fleshing out at some point, but I'm happy to do it anyway. And I think they're tactics and I hope I can um, flesh that out in a way where people can see them as tactics to execute as well. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to starting that conversation. And by the way, I could fit you in for a full hour on the 27th. You don't have to look at your calendar right now, but, but I would love to put you on the calendar for a full hour and go deeper on this and get back to me on whether the 27th works. But why don't we why don't we get it started and share a few ideas? Yeah. All right. Well, so uh, here are three things that I think, and I'm going to beg your audiences. Um, what do I beg? I beg their uh, attention and 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 try not to as I go through these. Um, try not to have any preconceived notions about what they are. Just do your best to let your brain flow free and listen to them at face value because they, a few of them have, a couple of these of the three have a connotation associated with them that I would love it if you could dispel of the connotation, which by the way is changing your thinking, right? So the first one I would tell people, Dave, these are just ways to actually execute. It's going to be a little bit surprising for some people. And I would say learn to meditate, believe it or not. Now, I just want you to know if there's a couple hundred people watching this, a hundred people just rolled their eyes and went, oh my God, you got to be kidding. But here's the deal. That's what I thought originally um, until we started to see the science come in. 
daily meditation, 10 to 15 minutes a day of daily meditation has a direct impact on a part of your brain called the insular cortex. Again, I don't expect you to go research this or whatever. If you want to, you could. The insula or the insular cortex is a part of your brain that basically allows you and gives you a greater capacity to tell yourself a different story. So when we're not executing, I just want you to know you're telling yourself a story, right? And we make up all kinds of reasons not to do it. And by the way, they all seem right to us. You know, outside of it, other people call them excuses and stuff like that. And it's probably they are. Um, but the truth is, when we begin to meditate, our brains change over time. There's a great new book, if you want to read it, by Daniel Goldman. Daniel Goldman is the, um, he is the pioneer of the field of emotional intelligence. Many people on the call have, know his work. Uh, he wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence. He's written Primal Leadership. He's a Harvard, you know, dude. Um, he recently wrote a book called Altered Traits, and it's the science of how meditation helps our brain. And, and when you get into that, if people would be willing to understand the science, I'm telling you, not a day would go by where 10 to 15 minutes a day, you wouldn't learn to steal your brain. So that would be the first one. And when you do that and your insular cortex begins to change, you actually see your world differently. And this is the, this is the foundation and essence of changing how we think. So while you might be looking for tangible things, I start from the beginning and give you a tangible skill to say if we did that, we would actually change the way we think. Make sense? Love it. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. The second would be practice mindfulness. And the second and the third one are actually, um, uh, they're a little bit tied to one another. Mindfulness is all around being attentive. And this really is um, the essence of emotional intelligence. If I were to define emotional intelligence, which, by the way, has been this field now that has absolutely exploded, not just in neuroscience or psychology, but in business. Um, Google and Amazon, these people are, are employed. And by the way, both Google and Amazon have a full-time program who pay their employees to meditate because they're, this isn't just some hokey thing. This is something that they're seeing some results on. But mindfulness is all about... How do we, uh, I was going to define emotional intelligence. Um, how do we know why we feel what we feel in any given moment? And then know it so well that we don't let our um, actions be inconsistent with our convictions. So let's say someone needs to improve their tech. Let's say someone needs to deep dive into their CRM more. That's it. You wake up one day, I'm going to get into my CRM more. I'm going to be more proactive with my database. And you have this thought and then you get busy because that's what happens to people, right? Everybody reports that, man, I had this idea in the morning and then it's five o'clock and now it's gone. The truth of the matter is it's more likely that you didn't do that based on how reaching out to your database or using some tool, how it makes you feel. That's what emotional intelligence is all about. But mindfulness can teach us a way to go, wow, let me understand that. Let me see that. Um, and, you know, so practicing mindfulness allows us to see what's very real in the moment, because if we do, then we have a better shot at dealing with what the real problem is. And, and so, but we're, again, we're not trained to do this. And so a lot of times people go, go, okay, I need accountability, or I need another system, or I need another platform. And I sustain that what they really need to do is pay attention to how they're really thinking and feeling. And so mindfulness, and there's, there's a, I mean, if you type in mindfulness into Google, you, I don't know, you'd probably have to really narrow that search. There's mindfulness in eating. Uh, there's a whole field of that. Um, but it's become a blossoming field in, in neurobiology and, neuros and psychology just because it's so huge in how it's helped people. So that'd be the second one. So, and then the so, last, yeah. So anyway, real quick before we go through that one, one of the things we've done for years when we're, you know, what, let's say a branch or a company and we're, you know, telling them, hey, you should use Mortgage Coach. Now, like lots of times it's a webinar. So just the fact that they signed up for the webinar and they came, you know, that's like, they want to change. They're like, we know this is a good thing. We know it's better than what we do. And then we've often put people, you know, we've always kind of, maybe we've oversimplified it, but we think, hey, if you get clear on your why, and I think that doing that why work, you know, we've got a little why worksheet, by the way, if you're watching this, we'll put a link down below to the Mortgage Coach why worksheet. But it, if, if they take the time and actually think through, okay, why do I want to implement mortgage coach? Could I have it? Uh, and they write it out 
and they get, you know, clear and personal on it. Is that kind of fit within the mindfulness bucket? Is that something that would be a, you know, mindfulness work to, to build a house or something? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mindfulness work. And that's why I'm saying we need probably your, your bigger hour to kind of flesh that out. But your question is, is doing the why worksheet as a step in this process, if I understood your question correctly, is that part of mindfulness? Is that correct? That is like, my question. Is that a step in understanding? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, again, you, you can get I can get into the brain a little bit about this. You're trying to get people, the prefrontal cortex part of the brain is the part of the brain that uses logic and language and reason. When you start getting into people's emotions, which is what why does, by the way, when you understand your purpose and your why, and you have this connection to a deeper sense of meaning and purpose, which is what your little why thing is guiding people to, you're getting people out of their prefrontal cortex and into their limbic system. The limbic system is where effectively we have emotions, right? Our hippocampus, our amygdala, our thalamus, all part, and the insular cortex, by the way, all part of the limbic system, which is where we have emotions. You doing that is bringing people to a more emotional part of the brain, which is really interesting is because that's where we take action from. We don't take action often from our prefrontal cortex. If we did, no one would have bad habits, right? I go around the country and teach people the language when we say, I know. When you say, I know, so I tell people, hey, did you know that exercise is good for you? People are like, yeah, I know. Knowing in the prefrontal cortex is not equated with action. So your first step in how you're doing that with people is actually getting people beyond this logic center into the limbic system, which is where they can. So yes, I think it's wonderful that you do that. I think it's a great step in, in the mindfulness thing. Cool. Well, let's, let's do the third one and then we'll tee people up for a bigger yeah. conversation down the road. Yeah. So the, the third one um, I think is related to it. And the third one is the practice of what we call metacognition. And, you know, if you and I were smart, we would have, uh, we would have uh, had a little slide deck here and you would have thrown it up there and shown people these words, but metacognition Meta is a Greek word. It means roughly about or close to or like, and cognition is just simply thinking. So metacognition is thinking about thinking. So uh, it's close to mindfulness, but it's an actual tangible skill. And anybody can practice this. And in fact, um, one of the exercises that we do in our workshops is I have people, and if you wanted to do it right now, you could. I have people write down every pet peeve they can think of. Like if you if we can if we had more time I'd walk everyone through this exercise but make a list of every pet peeve small little things that bug you you know like the toilet paper rolled backwards or put in upside down or whatever that bugs people right and I have people make a list of everything that bugs them and I give them three or four five minutes to do this and you watch some people writing really writing down this list this bugs me I hate when people are late for meetings or when they chew their gum like this or they don't use their turn signal or you know whatever pet peeves are. And so when they're done with that exercise, one of the first things I point out to people is, by the way, if you have an extensive list of pet peeves, um, all I can tell you is the more pet peeves you have, the less likable you are. <laughs> An extensive list of pet peeves has a little bit to do with your likability. If you ever wanted to hang around someone that's just got a million pet peeves, right? So as a salesperson, you might want to just pay attention, be attentive, mindful of how many pet peeves you have. But then I have people pick one pet peeve and I ask them to practice metacognition on that pet peeve. What is it about that that bugs me? That's the question. Why does that little thing bug me? Now, if you ask yourself that question, your brain already has an answer. Well, because it's stupid or people shouldn't do that. But think about it. Why do I let that thing bug me? And I always ask people, do you believe that you are given the ability to have control over your emotions? And everybody says yes. But when something else in the world bugs you, you're basically abdicating responsibility to that thing. And so you don't have control of your emotions because that thing's controlling your emotions. So if you practice on, that, on one pet peeve, why does that bug me? You're essentially practicing that cognition, which by the way, is a skill. And when you practice that, you can start doing bigger things like, wow, why don't I use the mortgage coach? Why am I not deploying technology? I wonder what that's about. And it's less of a judgment and more of a curiosity. If you could become curious about yourself, then it's amazing some of the things that we'd be willing to see. And that level of curiosity is what we call metacognition. 
So that was, that was it in five minutes, but usually we take, you know, like a whole half a day to teach people how to practice metacognition. So you got the uh, abbreviated TED version of all of that. Meditation, well, mindfulness, and metacognition. There you go. Well, Steve, we, we definitely have to have you back. Um, just in the prep of this, I know there's other tactics. I'm just going to say the words because I want people to think about it. Uh, you mentioned positive visualization. Uh, we'll talk about that more when we have the one hour. I, I love the tiny habits and small wins. You know, part of, you know, our call it roadmap for change is get clear on your why, write it down, and then, you know, create 10 total cost analysis. You know, do something. And each one of those is like a 10 minute, you know, first time you do it, it's a five to 10 minute task. And, and so I'm going to put a lot of thought into that between now and next time we talk. Another thing you might want to think about when we come back and as a promise to everybody is like, hey, we'll come in. It's almost like it's a one hour online change workshop. Um, but hey, if people want to hire you, I mean, obviously they, they got to get your book. I know you have a new um, group coaching program, but if people want to connect with you, get more value from Rewire and Steve Scanlon, you know, how can they reach out to you and connect with you in your community? Yeah. It, 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 first of all, our, our website uh, is becoming more and more robust. So you can go to rewireinc.com. Uh, you can uh, reach out to info at rewire. Uh, like you said, I'd love it if more people bought the book on Amazon, not because I'm trying to sell a million books, but we're getting the message of the lizard brain out. And we It's a story. It's a pretty easy story about how the lizard brain can change people. So uh, still the lizard is on Amazon. You can do that. I, I would like to tell you that I, I think the group wire thing that we're doing, because one of the things we're realizing is coaching. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching. And if people are interested in that, you can reach out to us through our website. And that's just real easy. But the group wire thing is becoming really interesting for us because there's a way to put people into small groups and take advantage of some, um, some things that the brain does in tight groups. We release a, a chemical called oxytocin, um, which is a, a feeling of connectedness, which releases a ton of other stuff in our limbic system that allows us to free think and stuff. And I think that's what you're doing with your community. The reason you have a community is not just probably to sell more, but I think when people feel like they're a part of something, um, you, you actually see more change. And so that's what our group bars are doing. They're groups of seven. It's far more affordable than, than just one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, again, we do that if people want, but uh, I think the group things can be really, really powerful for a lot of people. So by all means, reach out to us and I appreciate the plug. And they and they could get that on your website. So the group wire Absolutely. is on your website. Absolutely. And, it, and I can't remember last time, I don't know if it was last time I interviewed, at one point I interviewed you and you took people to some type of a test. And do you still have anything like that? Any online tests that people can go Come through? Come on, man. The lizard quiz. That's if people buy the book, you get the lizard quiz. But uh, do, do you be so proud of me, man? Uh, you know how technologically disinclined I am. And so I, I think you sometimes look at me and want to, you know, holding my hand and, you know, I'm the, I'm the guy that, you know, here you are running this tech company and I don't even know how can openers work, man. So, but uh, we did build a lizard quiz. And in fact, if people want to, after you read the book or even before it, if you want to understand more about your lizard brain, we built an assessment that's called the lizard quiz. And we even have a measurement and a number around that. Um, it's your lizard quotient. It's all kind of fun, but it's actually, there's some pretty cool stuff that we're doing with that. You can take the lizard quiz. You could go to www.lizardquiz.com right now, and it's free. You can take the lizard quiz for free. And it's a Love fairly it. robust report. You get a six or seven page uh, report that helps you understand which of the four characteristics of the lizard brain affects you the most, and people can just go take that right now. Love it. Well, hey, I'm going to put links to all that below. Steve, thank you for taking time, bringing this value to the mortgage coach community. If you are watching this and you got some value from it, give us a like, like check the box, say, I liked it. Good job, Steve. Um, share it with your mortgage friends. Comment below. I'm going to be bringing Steve back. So whether you're watching this in YouTube or whether you're watching it in Facebook, if you have a question for Steve that you want to make sure we cover, put it in comments. Thank you very much, my brother. I look forward to the next time we do this. I feel like I feel like I'm part of the community now. I feel so communal. All that oxytocin flowing between you and I. I love it. Peace. Peace.